Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us. I'm Mindy Mandel, and I am here with Jacob and Jed. We're going on with The Republic. Now, as always, there is a PDF in the description box for those of you who don't have the text. We're using the um, Loeb edition, and it's uh, Paul Shorey is the translator. Um, but it's okay if you're using a different text, of course, and I'll give you um, the Stephanus numbers along the way. So we're going through the um, the virtues, and we've covered three of them already, and now we're going on to justice. So, so we've done wisdom, and then we did courage, and then temperance, or um, I think they call it soberness in this text, um, soft pursuit. And now we're going on to justice. So the way we ended last time was we read section 10 of book four. Let me jump to that now. And we, we read through this, but we didn't really discuss it. And so I was thinking to pull out some of the main quotes as a kind of a review, but I think that it would actually make more sense just to refresh everyone's mind to read through it again. It isn't that long. I think it would actually be a faster way to do it. And then we can all participate in the conversation. So we're going to start with section 10. This is 433A. For those of you using a different translation, it's page 367 in this text. So any either of you wanted to um anything either of you wanted to say any comments from last time anything you've been thinking about or you want to just jump in we're good to go all right okay so keep the same roles we're fine with that sure yes. okay all right so jacob anytime you're ready okay socrates uh mm -hmm. listen then and learn if there if there is anything in what i say for what we laid down in the beginning as a universal requirement when we were founding our city, this, I think, or some form of this, is justice. And what, did, uh, and what we did lay down, and often said, if you recall, was that each one man must perform one social service in the state for which his nature was best adapted. Yes, we said that. <laughs> and, again, that to do one's own business and not to be a busybody is justice, is a saying that we have heard from many and have very often repeated ourselves. We have. This, then, my friend, if taken in a certain sense, appears to be justice this principle of doing one's own business. Do you know whence I infer this? No, but tell me. I think that this is the remaining virtue in the state after our consideration of soberness, courage, and intelligence, a quality which made it possible for them all to grow up in the body politic and which, when they have sprung up, preserves them as long as it is present. And I hardly need to remind you that we said that justice would be the residue after we had found the other three. That is an unavoidable conclusion. But moreover, if we were required to decide what it is whose indwelling presence will contribute most to making our city good, it would be, diff would be a difficult decision whether it was the unanimity, unanimity, unanimity of rulers and ruled or the conservation in the minds Conservation in the minds of the soldiers of the convictions produced by law as to what things are or are not to be feared, or the watchful intelligence that resides in the guardians, or whether this is the chief cause of its goodness, the principle embodied in child, woman, slave, free, artisan, ruler and ruled, 
that each performed his one task as one man and was not a versatile busybody. Hard to decide indeed. A thing then that in its contribution to the excellence of a state vies with of a state vies with and rivals its wisdom its soberness its bravery is this principle of everyone in it doing his own task it is indeed and is not justice the name you would have to give to the principle that rivals these as conducing to the virtue of state? By all means. Consider it in this wise too, if so you will be convinced. Will you not assign the conduct of lawsuits in your state to the rulers? Of course. Will not this be the chief aim of their decisions, that no one shall have what belongs to others, or be deprived of his own? Nothing else but this. On the assumption that this is just? Yes. From this point of view too, then, the having and doing of one's own and what belongs to oneself would admittedly be justice. That is so. Consider now whether you agree with me. A carpenter undertaking to do the work of a cobbler or a cobbler of a carpenter or their interchange of one another's tools or honors or even the attempt of the same man to do both. The confounding of all other functions would not, think you, greatly injure a state, would it? Not much. But when I fancy one who is by nature an artisan or some kind of money maker tempted and incited by wealth or command of votes, or bodily strength, or some similar advantage, tries to enter into the class of the soldiers, or one of the soldiers into the class of consulars and guardians, for which he is not fitted, and these interchange their tools and their honors, or when the same man undertakes all these functions at once, then I take it, you too believe that this kind of, of substitution and meddlesomeness is the ruin of a state. By all means. The, inf the interference with one another's business, then, of three existent classes and the substitution of the one for the other is the greatest injury to a state and would most rightly be designated as the thing which chiefly works it harm? Precisely so. And the thing that works the greatest harm to one's own state, will you not pronounce to be injustice? Of course. This, then, is injustice. Okay, so last time I think we agreed that this makes no sense. But we're going to see what we can pull out from this as we're going forward, and hopefully things will start to make sense as we get into some more sections. So going back to the beginning of section 10, back on page 367, um, I want to pull out this one line here um, that each one man must perform one social service, let me highlight this one. Sorry, each one man must perform one social service in the state for which his nature was best adapted. Okay, that was from an, it was a reminder of an earlier discussion that was taken in the building of the city state. Now we're going to see how he's, how Plato is going to take this idea and 
bring it into the idea of justice in the soul. Um, one thing I do want to highlight is this idea of nature, talking about a person's nature. He's going to keep using this word throughout without defining it. It's going to be defined in book five. So we just want to hold on to that idea of nature. Okay, but we each have a certain nature and what's adapted to each person. Um, and now as we go through this, we, oh yeah, um, oh yeah, okay. I'm going to go on to page 369 now. So we're starting to get some definitions, right? So he's kind of pulling out some phrases here, at least that seem to be def pieces of the definition of justice. So what we saw at the bottom of 367 was the first piece right, that there's some social service that each person um, performs for the state that is adapted to that person's nature. And do you see another definition at the top of the next page? Principle of doing one's own business. Right, yes. Right, right at the top. Do one's own business and not be a busybody is justice. Right. And it, he and then he tells us it has to be taken in a certain sense. We don't yet know what that sense is, but taken in a certain sense, it appears to be justice. Now, there's another interesting point here. If you go on to the next part here, I think that this is the remaining virtue in the state after our consideration of the other three. And then he's, so, and then he's telling us another piece then of justice. It is a quality which made it possible for them all to grow in the body politic. And when they have sprung up, this justice is what preserves them as long as it is present. For those of you watching on YouTube, sorry, the highlighter is not really obeying well. So I got a bit more than I wanted to highlight there. But um, oh, I wanted to get the line above it. Okay. Yeah, it's highlighting too much. Okay, but it's but whatever justice is, it is a quality that sets the foundation for the others to grow. And then once they're there, it preserves them all. So it's a very interesting thing, isn't it? Something very curious. Each doing their own job, and somehow this is the foundation that allows the other virtues to grow, and somehow this is what preserves them, right? It doesn't make sense at this point. I think we can all agree. But these are all interesting pieces that we're getting. Now, looking at the second half of page 369, do you recognize descriptions of the other three virtues? See if you can pull those out. Right. It's uh, the conservation in the minds of the soldiers mm -hmm. as, you know, to know what things are or are not to be feared. Mm. Uh, Watchful which, and... I'm sorry, which of the virtues is that? Courage. That's courage. Good. And then next mm -hmm. would be watchful intelligence. Mm -hmm. So wisdom. Mm. Good. Is the last one each performing his one task, not being a versatile busybody? That that has to be justice. Never mind. So mm -hmm. good. Maybe yeah. temperance came first, and I just mm -hmm. missed it. Mm -hmm. Jed, can you help him out? Well, he seems to be going from the bottom up. Um, 
making uh, what would contribute most to making our city good would be difficult, whether it would be the u- unanimity. Hmm? Unanimity. Unanimity of rulers and mm-hmm. ruled. Mm-hmm. So that seems like what we were talking about last week with uh, right. decide, like, let's everyone decide who should be ruling us. Mm-hmm. And so that's like at the bottom, up that pyramid that we often see. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Or the, con- uh, the conservation in the minds of the soldiers, that sounds like courage. Um, mm-hmm. uh, the convictions produced by the law which we're defining Mm -hmm. as to what things Mm -hmm. should be feared. Mm -hmm. The watchful intelligence sounds like the thing that sits on the top that resides Mm -hmm. in the guardians Mm -hmm. or whether this is the chief cause of its goodness, the principle embodied in child, woman, slave, free artisan ruler and ruled that each Mm -hmm. performed his one task as Mm -hmm. one man and was not a, versatile busybody seems like the last one left over right yes good yeah so those are our four virtues kind of summarized for us and and he opened the sentence by saying that um it's hard to decide which one of these is um contributes the most okay but these are the four um And so there's a nice little summary there. Um, On the next page, we have yet again another definition of justice. And right in the middle of the page there, the having and doing of one's own. So that's uh, 434A. The having and doing of one's own and what belongs to oneself would admittedly be justice. So we still, and we, he's still talking about it in terms of the city state, and it's not quite clear yet, perhaps, of what this would look like in the soul, what he's really talking about. So he's just giving us a bunch of the pieces here. Um, by the way, you again see the term by nature towards the bottom of the page. The one who is by nature an artisan or some kind of money maker. So this idea of nature is going to keep coming up. And then he ends it in a very curious way. Um, He says that the interference with one another's business, and this is the very last part, it's uh, page 373, the interference with one another's business of these three existing classes and the substitution of one for the other is the greatest injury to a state. Okay, it's not really clear how that is the greatest injury to a state or the thing that most rightly would be designated as the thing which chiefly works at harm. But he's telling us at the end there that, um, that, that this is the case. And then he gives us a definition of injustice which will make sense once we get to the soul. But what he's saying here is that injustice is not crimes or overthrowing the government or anything like that. It's the interference of these three things with one another, right? And this is what works the greatest harm in one's own state. And so that's the definition of injustice. Okay, so he he left us with a lot of questions at this point. I think we can all agree on that. So we're going to go on and hopefully kind of piece it together. But at this point, is there anything that either of you wanted to ask or comment on? Or we maybe we'll hold our questions and just go on to the next section then. Okay. Whenever you're ready. All right. Again, let us put it in this way. The proper functioning of the money-making class, the helpers and the guardians, each doing its own work in the state, being the reverse of that just described, would be justice and would render the city just. I think the case is thus. 
and no otherwise. Let us not yet affirm it quite fixedly, but if this form, when applied to the individual man, is accepted there also as a definition of justice, we will then concede the point, for what else will there be to say? But if not, then we will look for something else. But now let us work out the inquiry in which we suppose that, if we found some larger thing that contained justice and viewed it there, we should more easily discover its nature in the individual man. And we agreed that this larger thing is the city, and so we constructed the best city in our power, well knowing that in the good city it would of course be found. What then we thought we saw there, we must refer back to the individual, and if it is confirmed, all will be well. But if something different manifests itself in the individual, we will return again to the state and test it there, and it may be that, by examining them side by side and rubbing them against one another, as it were from the fire sticks, we may cause the spark of justice to flash forth, and when it is thus revealed, conform, or confirm it in our own minds. Well, that seems a sound method, and that is what we must do. Then. If you call a thing by the, na by the same name, whether it is big or little, is it unlike in the way in which it is called the same or like? Like. Then, a just man too will not differ at all from a just city in respect of the very form of justice but will be like it. Yes, like. But now the city was thought to be just because three natural kinds existing in it performed each its own function. And again, it was sober, brave, and wise because of certain other affections and habits of these three kinds. True. Then, my friend, we shall thus expect the individual also to have these same forms in his soul, and by reason of identical affections of these with those in the city to receive properly the same appellations. Inevitable. Goodness gracious. Here is another trifling inquiry into which we have plunged. The question whether the soul really contains these three forms in itself or not. It does not seem to me at all trifling. For, per for perhaps, Socrates, the saying is true, that fine things are difficult. Apparently. And let me tell you, Glaucon, that in my opinion, we shall never uh, apprehend this matter accurately from such methods as we are now employing in discussion. For there is another, longer, and harder way that conducts to this. Yet we may perhaps discuss it on the level of our previous statements and inquiries. May not, may we not acquiesce in that? For I, for my part, should be quite satisfied with that for the present. And I surely should be more than satisfied. Don't you weary then, but go on with the inquiry. 
is it not then impossible for us to avoid admitting this much, that the same forms and qualities are to be found in each one of us that are in the state? They could not get there from any other source. It would be absurd to suppose that the element of high spirit was not derived in states from the private citizens who are reputed to have this quality, as the populations of the Thracian and Scythian lands, and generally of northern regions, or the quality of love of knowledge, which would chiefly be attributed to the region where we dwell, or the love of money, which we might say is not least likely to be found in the Phoenicians and the population of Egypt. One certainly might. This is the fact, then and there is no difficulty in recognizing it. Certainly not. Okay, so what was the point of this section? What did you pull out as the main point here? Not clear yet. Okay, so let's try to open this up a little here. So looking at page 375 there, Notice that here, he reminded us of the analogy, didn't he? Right, that we're comparing the city-state. Um, going, like, looking like four lines down. But now let us work out the inquiry in which we suppose that if we found some larger thing that contained justice and viewed it there, we should more easily discover its nature in the individual man. Right, so that was the idea that Socrates had come up with in book two. Remember that um, Adimantus and Glaucon laid out their challenge to him, and he said, that's that's amazing, that's beautiful, I love it, so I'm going to try this, Um, but it's going to be very hard to recognize justice, especially since these two guys clearly didn't know what justice was, and they're talking about it in terms that didn't really makes sense. And so he has to give us this long analogy. So he's reminding us here of what he had done and what he had agreed. And then he says, he goes on to say that we agreed that this larger thing, it's not working. We agreed that this larger thing is the city. And so we constructed the best city in our power, well knowing that in the good city, it would of course be found. We could find justice in the good city. And so that's a reminder there that all the points in the state then have to have some correlate in the soul. They have to have an analog in the soul. But it doesn't mean that everything about the soul is necessarily in the state. All right, so that's the way the analogy works. He's looking at the city-state for the sake of understanding the soul. So what he wants to tell us about the soul, what he wants to focus on, has to be in the state. Because that's the analogy. And if you look at uh, what's on the next page here, um, I highlighted it in my book, so it's faster to look at that. But it's... Right. Oh, yes, let me just highlight this one part here. Um, that's I'm going back to um, page 375. What then we thought we saw there in the city-state must refer back to the individual. That is how the analogy is functioning, right? So that right there is the statement of the analogy. Whatever we see in the city-state has to refer back to the soul. It doesn't necessarily mean that everything about the the soul can be found in the city-state. It doesn't mean they're perfectly parallel, but... The way he's using the analogy is he's setting up the city-state and everything that's in the city-state has to apply to the soul. And then at the top of the next page, 
We see there that a just man too will differ, will not differ at all from a just city in respect of the very form of justice, but will be like it. Now, wherever you see form in this section, it is eidos in Greek. Okay, so he is talking about the virtues as eidos. And so we can see the eidos in the state, we can see the eidos in the soul. And again, at the bottom of the page here, we have the question of whether the soul really contains these three forms in itself or not. And again, forms is eidos. Okay. So that's the question that we're looking at. You see it again, actually, on the next page. There's another one. Um, the same forms and qualities. It's impossible for us to avoid admitting this much, that the same forms and qualities are to be found in each one of us that are in the state. Okay, forms again is idos. These are big points. These are big deals <laughs> that we're talking about. This is the significance of eidos mm -hmm. which are not forms as they're commonly translated in modern schools mm -hmm. and we're not talking about a political state at all which again is mm -hmm. how plato is often taught in schools these are two big like pivot points between what the text mm -hmm. says and how plato was taught mm. Yes, we don't yet see quite how he's using it, but we can see that, yes, it's very different from what we learned in school. Absolutely. Um, just one other thing I want to point out here is the very last section, the last page here, um, page 381, is he's giving us a little bit of a of a foreshadowing here of the tripartite soul by through his example of like the thracians um have a the love of high spirit and the quality of the love of knowledge which the thinians are known for the egyptians and the phoenicians apparently had a love of money and those three are going to have their parallels in the tripartite soul. So that's just a little bit of foreshadowing there. Is it racist to, to call a, a group of people those that have a love of money? Well, I don't think he's trying to be politically correct here, but... Um, and I don't necessarily know that the Phoenicians saw that as an insult. But if you're assuming it's something bad. Well, like, yeah, I mean, it's like, it's like... Like the Spartans were known for being warlike. Um, is that good or bad? And it depends on your attitude. But it's just sort of as a stereotype, perhaps. But, um, yeah. I don't think someone I, who's I, said, like, your, your particular race uh, has a love of money. Well, we're actually the wise ones. I don't know whether yeah, they would yeah. take that well. <laughs> yeah, it may not go over well. Yeah. But he knows his audience, so. Yeah, because he says that the love of wisdom is the is the is attributed to the region where we dwell. So they're all Athenians. No one there's gonna complain. But anyway, the example works fine for us, for our purposes. Um, so, okay, so we can go on now to the next section here. We're going to get a little bit more into his idea of what justice is, because it's still not clear to us. Okay, so cool. uh, whenever you're ready. Mm -hmm. But the matter begins to be difficult when you ask whether we do all these things with the same thing, or whether there are three things and we do one thing with one and one with another. Learn with one part of ourselves, feel anger with another, and yet, and with yet a third desire, the pleasures of nutrition and generation and their kind. 
or whether it is with the entire soul that we function in each case when we once begin. That is what is really hard to determine properly. I think so too. Let us then attempt to define the boundary and decide whether they are identical with one another in this way. How? It is obvious that the same thing will never do or suffer opposites in the same respect in relation to the same thing and at the same time. So that if we ever, or so, so that if ever we find these contradictions in the functions of the mind, we shall know that it was not the same thing functioning, but a plurality. Very well. Consider then what I am saying. Stay on. Is it possible for the same thing at the same time, in the same respect, to be at rest and in motion? By no means. Let us have our understanding still more precise, lest as we proceed we become involved in dispute. If anyone should say of a man standing still but moving his hands and head that the same man is at the same time at rest and in motion, we should not, I take it, regard that as the right way of expressing it but rather that a part of him is at rest, and a part in motion. Is not that so? It is. Then, if the disputant should carry the jest still further with the subtlety that tops at any rate still, uh, that at any rate stand still as a whole at the same time that they are in motion, when the peg fixed in one point they revolve, and that the same is true of any other case of circular motion about the same spot, we should reject the statement on the ground that the response and the movement in That's such repose. cases... The repose, okay, yeah. We should reject the statement on the ground that the repose and the movement in such cases were not in relation to the same parts of the objects, but we would say that there was a straight line and a circumference in them, and that in respect of the straight line, they are standing still since they do not incline to either side, but in respect of the circumference, they move in a circle but that when, as they revolve, they incline the perpendicular to right or left, or forward or back, then they are in no wise at rest. That, and that would be right. No such remarks, then, will disconcert us, or any wit the more make us believe that it is ever possible for the same thing at the same time, in the same respect, and the same relation to suffer, be, or do opposites. They will not be, I am sure. All the same that we may not be forced to examine at tedious length the entire list of such contentions and convince ourselves that they are false. Let us proceed on the hypothesis that this is so, with the understanding that, if it ever appear otherwise, everything that results from the assumption shall be invalidated. That is what we must do. Okay, and that's the end of this section. So it's not immediately clear what this has to do with justice. But what we can see, going back to page 381, 
and this is um, 436E, or I'm sorry, 436A, A, B, um, is that we have the main question here is whether there are three things and we do one thing with one part and one with another. Whether we do all these, let me go up ahead. Whether we do all these things with the same thing or whether there are three things and we do one with one part and one with another. Okay, so that's the question he's opening up. So he's starting to get into the tripartite stall idea. So this is introducing it. Okay. Um, at this point, did anything jump out at you? Any questions, any comments? For me, I thought when he's saying uh, the same thing at the same time, the mm -hmm. same respect and the same mm -hmm. relation, it mm -hmm. reminded me of uh, Aristotle's categories. Mm -hmm. So they're looking at a substance, mm -hmm. and then after substance, there's like uh, quantity, mm -hmm. and then quality, and mm -hmm. that I know time is in there uh relations in there mm -hmm. i'm not sure what respect could be but i'm sure it matches up mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. i think uh you can find these categories probably through plato's dialogues as well just more cryptically not like spelled mm -hmm. out in a book mm -hmm. but, but mm -hmm. yeah that, mm -hmm. that's all right yeah this is the kind of argument that yeah plato often uses as well mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's an interesting way to go, right? That the same, and he's going to give some examples as we go on to the next section, but that's the, if the soul is one, it can't suffer opposite things at the same time. And so if it does suffer opposite things, then it sounds like maybe there's a different aspect of it, a different part of it that's doing each thing. Like the spinning top, it had, there's the part that is staying still, and then there's the, the circumference that's going around the line, right? This language mirrors what we mm -hmm. see in um, the Parmenides. Um, mm -hmm. Parmenides explains the difference between circular motion and straight motion. Mm -hmm. And he also explains the terms of same and difference. Mm -hmm. So this is Socrates hearing this kind of... Uh, description early on in his philosophical journey when he was really young mm -hmm. he met Parmenides mm -hmm. but it's interesting to hear the same um cadence and the same um reasoning mm -hmm. come up again mm -hmm. here later up later in his life mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. he's using it he's kind of mm -hmm. um functioning with it whatever he got from Parmenides mm -hmm. seems to be mm -hmm. internalized and he's functioning uh with it in uh, using it in a way with his friend here. So mm -hmm. uh, I think that's interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And the Parmenides does go into this in a more, um, more in, in terms of the Eidos, whereas here we're seeing more of an application of it. And yeah. yeah so, yeah. Um, but we're going to see how he's using it. Okay. By going on to the next section. That's a good point, Jed. Um, so the, we'll go on to the next section then, section 13, because now we're going to get a better sense of why he's introducing this sort of, seems rather abstract for the discussion we're having, right? But now we're going to see how he's using it in section 13. Well, it's funny you bring up um, Eidos, because the other thing that stood out to me reading this is um, not just the... Um, precise dialectic mm -hmm. definition of movement and how mm -hmm. circular movement is different from regular movement. Mm -hmm. But um, this description of um, same thing at the same, to be the same thing, it has to be in the same place at the same time with respect to the same part. Mm -hmm. This argument reminded me of a, um, the argument used to talk about Ados and the nature of Ados Usia. Like the, it's kind of like one of the first ways of describing it is to say two physical objects 
can't be the same unless they're occupying the same space. Mm-hmm. But then you could have one coffee mug and move it over and have another coffee mug and occupy the same space. So you have to qualify it at the same time. And then that's this is used to uh, differentiate the nature of what ADOS is. While mm-hmm. physical objects um, can't be the same because they can't occupy the same space at the same time with respect to the same things and the same parts, mm-hmm. mind doesn't have that limitation, allowing it mm-hmm. to fold back on itself and connect with itself at all points. Mm-hmm. This is the distinguishing feature that separates what's translated as forms mm-hmm. as this certain kind of usia quality that is not physical, that doesn't have these limitations compared to the physical world. Mm-hmm. Ideos or forms are not a physical thing and they don't have that limitation. Mm-hmm. Different to what often is taught at school where a form is like a chair in heaven or something like that, a physical thing abstracted to an idea. So it's interesting that that this um, uh, this came up for me as we were reading it. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Um, that the same ados is in both the city state and in the individual soul, and he doesn't mean um, another copy of it. Like the, the chair in heaven is copied into many things. Um, but he's saying the exact same Eidos is in both the city state and in the soul. The, the significance mm-hmm. of making that point um, isn't mm-hmm. just random. It, it opens up the whole distinguishing feature of Platonic philosophy, mm-hmm. that of participation. If it's the mm-hmm. same in both, if there mm-hmm. isn't a limitation, that means that I could experience the idea of justice. Jacob can experience. We don't have to be a coffee mug moving to the side and the other one moving mm-hmm. in. And mm-hmm. this idea of participation is is fundamental to Platonism. Mm-hmm. And Absolutely. also, as we were saying earlier, it's the rejection of this idea of metaphysical participation that characterizes the understanding of the world that we have in our modern times, mm-hmm. which is interesting. Yeah. Yes, it's the distinction maybe between Plato and Aristotle, because there is no idea of really of participation in Aristotle the way there is in Plato. And uh, but that is a different discussion. So let's go on to section thirteen here, and so we're going to see how he's going to apply these sort of abstract ideas that he presented in section twelve. The idea that the same thing can't be in the same place at the same time, and blah blah blah. Okay, so let's see what he does with it. When you're ready. Uh, Socrates, Mm. uh, will you not then set down as opposed to one another ascent and descent and the endeavor after a thing to the rejection of it and embracing to repelling? Do not these and all things like these belong to the class of opposite actions or passions? It will make no difference which. None. But they are opposites. What then of thirst and hunger and the appetites generally, and again consenting and willing, would you not put them all somewhere in the classes just described? Will you not say, for example, that the soul of one who desires either strives for that which he desires or draws towards its embrace what it wishes to accrue to it, or again, insofar as it wills that anything be presented to it, nods assent to itself thereon as if someone put the question striving towards its attainment? I would say so. But what of not willing, and not consenting, nor yet desiring? Shall we not put these under the soul's rejection and repulsion from itself, 
and generally into the opposite class from all the former? Of course. This being so, shall we say that the desires constitute a class and that the most conspicuous members of that class are what we call thirst and hunger? We shall. Is not the one desire of drink the other of food? Yes. Then, in so far as it is thirst, would it be of anything more than that of which we say is it is a desire in the soul? I mean, is thirst thirst for hot drink or cold or much or little or in a word for a draught of any particular quant uh, quality? Or is it the fact that if heat is attached to the thirst, it would further render the desire, a desire of cold, and if cold, of hot? But if, owing to the presence of muchness, the thirst is much, it would render it a thirst for much, and if little, for little. But mere thirst will never be desire of anything else than that of which it is its nature to be, mere drink, and so hunger of food. That is so. Each desire in itself is of that thing, only of which it is its nature to be. The epithets belong to the quality, such as such or such. Let no one, then, disconcert us when off our guard with the objection that everybody desires not drink but good drink, and not food but good food, because the argument will run, all men desire good, and so, if thirst is desire, it would be of good drink, or of good whatsoever it is, and so, similarly, of other desires. Why? There, perhaps, would seem to be something in that. There, perhaps, would seem to be something in that objection. But I need hardly remind you that of relative terms, those that are somehow qualified are related to a qualified correlate. Those that are severally just themselves to a correlate that is just itself. I don't understand. Don't you understand that the greater is such as to be greater than something? Certainly. Is it not then the less? Yes. But the much greater than the much less. Is that not so? Yes. And may we add the one time greater than the one time less, and that which will be greater than that which will be less? Surely. And similarly of the more towards the fewer, and the double towards the half, and of all like cases, and again of the heavier towards the lighter, the swifter towards the slower, and yet again of the hot towards the cold, and all cases of that kind. Does not the same hold? By all means. But what of the sciences? Is it not the way of it, or is not the way of it the same? Science, which is just, that is, uh, Science, which is just that, is of knowledge, which is just that, or is of whatsoever we must assume the correlate of science to be, but a particular science of a particular kind 
is of some particular thing of a particular kind. I mean something like this. As there was a science of making a house, it differed from other sciences so as to be named architecture. Certainly. Was not this by reason of its being of a certain kind, such as no other of all the rest? Yes. And was it not because it was of something of a certain kind that it itself became a certain kind of science? And similarly of the other arts and sciences? That is so. Okay. Good, thank you. Okay, so we're seeing here now he's really being precise, right? He's clarifying that he wants to be really precise about the things he's talking about. Um, so he starts back on page 387, and uh, let me just jump back here to see the Stephanus numbers. Um, so we're at about 437C. And here he is introducing then the appetites. And at the bottom of the page that the desires constitute a class. All right, so he's starting to set up his tripartite soul. So first he's introducing the appetites or desires. And then he gets really precise with it, saying that um, Mere thirst will never be desire for anything else than that of which it is the nature to be, which would be some kind of drink. And if you want to bring in any adjectives or adverbs, those comparisons would be with their counterpart, adverb or adjective. All right, but so he's being very precise here. So he spent most of this section then focusing on the appetites or desires. And then he does introduce another class at the end. Which class did he introduce at the end? The relatives? No. Um, so the appetites were introduced. Yeah, there were, then he did bring in more the adjectives and the adverbs as the relative things about them. But um, we have the appetites. And then there's another section, another, he changed topic right at the end. Is it about sciences? Right, yes. And science, by the way, in Greek is episteme. And that's what he's talking about here. And so science is often used to talk about like subjects or a certain area of, of um, knowledge or understanding. Okay, so, so he brought in the sciences here. And that means that we're going to need one more section, and that's going to come in section 14. Um, before we go on to that, do either of you have any anything else jump out at you in this section? Anything you want to talk about? No. Okay. Then we're going to go on to the next. Well, actually, the... only that um, mm -hmm. when the discussion of justice mm -hmm. began, mm -hmm. he brought in the idea of different sciences or epistemes. Mm -hmm pertaining to different knowledges mm -hmm. um, as a way of um, uh, clarifying, getting more accurate, getting more precise on what Tracy Marcus was saying um, uh, about the advantage of the stronger. Mm -hmm. He brought in the idea, well, shouldn't the ruler have a kind of knowledge and isn't it particular to each class? Mm -hmm. Was there any, any connect? What are you seeing here? Is it something that's just holding out as like, oh, this is something that's probably going to connect? Or do you see a connection at this point? At the beginning, Socrates was using it. He was using mm -hmm. it in a kind of like a, a battle between this rambunctious young man and his very certain idea mm -hmm. of justice. But now mm -hmm. he's um, uh, drawing it out and using mm -hmm. the same um, uh, style of reasoning, but in a more, I don't know, building to something pertaining to justice mm -hmm. rather mm -hmm. than using mm -hmm. it in battle, you could say. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. There was before he was, he, he was, he had this in mind 
and he was using it in his argument. But now we're going to see what the actual, um, I want to say paradigm, but like the actual pattern that he's holding on to is so we can see what it was that he applied in his discussion with Thrasymachus. Yeah, because in, th with, in, th in the drama of the text, he talked about mm -hmm. being scared of Thrasymachus, I think, and him jumping out at, mm -hmm. at him and being off guard. Mm -hmm. And so he was able to use the same um, mm -hmm. seeing, understanding of mm -hmm. that he's using here, but while keeping his cool in, in, in the fear. Mm -hmm. So it was like Thrasymachus is more like a Spartan person. So mm. Socrates had to use philosophy mm. and courage mm -hmm. to hold on to that and use it um, and be like a guard dog to fight for the truth, mm -hmm. even in that situation. Mm -hmm. Whereas here he might be engaged in a um, Athenian with an Athenian person, <laughs> a, a person more mm. um, uh, akin to more like wisdom. Mm -hmm. So he's mm -hmm. able to bring it out in a more uh, mm -hmm. sort of, it's not a battle, it's more of a philosophical mm -hmm. reasoning discussion over mm -hmm. a longer period of time, building mm -hmm. out a whole sort of argument. Mm -hmm. So the yeah, two different actually, people. Right. And that actually gives us a nice segue into the next section, the Spartan type, because that's what's missing, right, from the three. So... Um, let's go on then to section 14. I think this will be the last section we read today, and we'll see how he lays out this next section. Okay, so Jacob, when you're ready. This then, if happily you now understand, is what you must say I then meant by the statement that of all things that are such as to be of something, those that are just themselves only are of things just themselves only, but things of a certain kind are of things of a kind. And I don't at all mean that they are of the same kind as the things of which they are, so that we are, are to suppose that the science of health and disease is a healthy or healthly and diseased science, and that of evil and good, evil and good. I only mean that as science became the science not of just the thing of which science is, but of some particular kind of thing, namely of health and disease, the result was that it itself became some kind of science, and this caused it to no longer, or to be no longer called simply science, but with the addition of the particular kind, medical science. I understand and agree that it is so. To return to thirst, then. Will you not class it with the things that are of something and say that it is what it is in relation to something, and it is, I presume, thirst? I will, namely, of drink. Then, if the drink is of a certain kind, so is the thirst. But thirst that is just thirst is neither of much nor little, nor good nor bad, nor in a word of any kind. But just thirst is naturally of just drink only. By all means. The soul of the thirsty, then, insofar as it thirsts, wishes nothing else than to drink and yearns for this, and its impulse is towards this. Obviously. Then, if anything draws it back when thirsty, it must be something different in it from that which thirsts, and drives it like a beast to drink. For it cannot be, we say, that 
the same thing with the same part of itself at the same time acts in opposite ways about the same thing. We must admit that it does not. So, I fancy it is not well said of the archer that his hands at the same time thrust away the bow and draw it nigh. But we should rather say that there is one hand that puts it away and another that draws to it. By all means. Are we to say then that some men, sometimes the though thirsty, refuse to drink? We are indeed, many and often. What then should one affirm about them? Is it not that there is a something in the soul that bids them drink, and a something that forbids, a different something that masters that which bids? I think so. And is it not the fact that that which inhabits such actions arises when it arises from the calculations of reason? But the impulses which draw and drag come through affections and diseases. Apparently. Not unreasonably shall we claim that they are two and different from one another, naming that in the soul whereby it reckons and reasons the rational, and that with which it loves, hungers, thirsts, and feels the flutter and titillation of other desires, the irrational and appetitive, companion of various repletions and repletions. pleasures. Repletions. Repletions. It would not be unreasonable, but quite natural, for us to think this. These two forms, then, let us assume to have been marked off as actually existing in the soul. But now, the thumos, or principle of high spirit, that with which we feel anger, is it a third? Or would it be identical in nature with one of these? Perhaps with one of these, the appetitive. But I once heard a story which I believe the, or what, sorry, I once heard a story which I believe that Leonidas, the son of Aglion, on his way up from the Piraeus, under the outer side of the northern wall, becoming aware of dead bodies that lay at the place of public execution, at the same time felt a desire to see them and a repugnance and aversion, and that for a time he resisted and veiled his head. But overpowered in despite of all by his desire, with wide staring eyes, he rushed up to the corpses and cried, There ye wretches, take your fill of the fine spectacle. I too have heard the story. Yet surely this anecdote signifies that the principle of anger sometimes fights against desires as an alien thing against an alien. Yes, it does. Okay. Thank you. So this last part then is really starting to lay out three different forms, if you will. Um, I'm going to look I'm looking now at the bottom of page 397. And uh, this is about 439C or D, this area here, where he says at the bottom here, um, 
sh- um, not unreasonably shall we claim that they are two and different from one another, naming that in the soul whereby it reckons and reasons the rational. Okay, so that's one section. So that which reckons and reasons, he's naming the rational. And that with which it loves, hungers, thirsts, and feels the flutter and titillation of other desires, the irrational and appetitive. So he named the other section the appetitive, um, a companion of various repletions and pleasures. And they agreed with that, right? Or his friend here agreed with that. I think it's Glaucon. And then he says, these two forms then let us assume to have been marked off as actually existing in the soul. Okay, so again, they're eidos in the soul. So these two sections, again, he named one of them the rational and the other one the appetitive. And they both are really existing in the soul actually existing. And now he's giving us a third section, the thumos, or the principle of high spirit. I'm going to just take a moment to highlight this. Okay, so he's saying that this is a third section. And then the question became, well, wait, we see this high spirit. Is it one of the other two? Does it fit in with them? Or is it actually a third section? Do you see why um, Glaucon initially thought that maybe it goes with the appetitive? Right? Glaucon's initial idea was um, perhaps it goes with one of these, the appetitive. Right. Why might he do that? He doesn't say, they don't open that up and see why he doesn't give any reason. But does it seem logical that it might be? That it's another desire? Right, right. Mm. Yeah, this brings you to like anger. Mm-hmm. It seems like an emotional mm. response. Like Right, okay. yeah. Right, right. He uses the word anger. And in fact, a lot of translators use anger as the translation. And I live in Japan, and I can tell you that in the Japanese translation, um, for the thumos section, they call that anger, or this third, this one section of the, the tripartite. So they just use the word for anger. And so it, it's really misunderstood. But yeah, this idea of anger is closely tied to the idea of the thumos. And so it just seems like another desire, right? So Glaucon very understandably says, oh, maybe it's one of the appetitive. Maybe it goes in with the appetitive section. There's really only two. So Socrates gives a story to counter this idea. What's the point of this story? I guess we all kind of understand this idea of like, um, this is like when it, like when you're driving and you see a car accident and you want to watch it, but you know you shouldn't. Okay, so we can all kind of relate to this sort of situation, maybe not quite as extreme as this. We don't usually pass a a place of like a pile of dead bodies after a public execution. That's not really something modern society can relate to. But the basic point of the story, I think we all understand. Um, What's Socrates doing with this story? He's demonstrating that there's like, a, conf- a conflict in the soul. Mm. If it was purely appetitive, then you wouldn't have that fight in you. Mm. You would just uh, view the spectacle, mm. but you don't want to view it as well. You're mm-hmm. spirit, right. high mm-hmm. spirit nature. Mm. Mm. Mm -hmm. right right so we're saying that there is this third section then or this third part in the soul um and socrates says at the end this anecdote signifies that the principle of anger 
sometimes fights against desires as an alien thing against an alien. So this part of us that is battling is what he's calling here the thumos or the principle of anger, or he called it up above here, high spirit. But he, so we're still going to have to see a little bit more of how these three parts function together. How does the thumos function with the wisdom loving part? You know, here we're seeing it battling with the, um, with the appetites, but we're not really seeing what is its connection to the wisdom loving part. In that story, yeah, then, rational. Mm. Mm -hmm. In that story, then, Sorry. there is a reasoning part that says, don't look at the horrific accident. Mm -hmm. There is a desiring part that wants to. Mm -hmm. And then when he goes along with it, there is the um, Thumos middle part that's, that sort of gets angry at the desires, saying, hey, mm -hmm. you wanted mm -hmm. to see this? Take your fill, mm -hmm. eyes, draw it in, you dope. Mm -hmm. Is that the three mm -hmm. parts in that analogy? Mm -hmm. Right, exactly. Yeah. Um, so that's the story. Um, now he's going to have to open it up a little bit more and, and clarify how those are the three parts. We can see them in that story. You're absolutely right, Jed. That was good to clarify that. Yeah. So the three parts are there, but we're not yet seeing exactly how the three parts function together. So we need to say, OK, this is the example. Now let's pull the three out from that story and see what are they doing. Okay, and so that's where we're going from here. Um, so we'll stop our reading there. Um, any of you have any final thoughts or comments? There was a question earlier on that, that mm -hmm. something, I think maybe it was worded strange. I didn't quite understand it. Okay. At the, okay. um, I think, 397, mm -hmm. um, where he says, okay. sometimes we're thirsty and refuse to drink. What then should one affirm about them? I guess those who refuse to drink, is it not that there is a something in the soul that bids them drink and a sub something that forbids, but a different something that masters that which bids. Mm -hmm. So I, I could understand that if you feel you want to drink all the beer, mm -hmm. you have a reasoning part mm -hmm. that says, Hey, don't drink all the beer. Mm -hmm. But he's saying that there's a, a, also a different part that's different than that which masters. But then he goes on to think and it, say, is it not the fact that when that which inhibits such actions arises, when it arises from the calculations of reason, so now it is the reasoning part, mm -hmm. but the impulses which draw and drag come through affections and diseases. Mm -hmm. So... Is what's he saying here? Well, there's you have this calculation, this reasoning part that says you should not drink for whatever the reason. Okay, but then there has to be some part of you that acts on it, that actually physically drags you away. This will open up more as we get more into what the thumos is, but the thumos has already been described as that which is that high-spirited part. It's the energy, if you will, that allows you to act on what the reasoning part says. Okay, so you're saying that there there is a, there can be an appetite, appetitive, that's the word, appetitive part that can draw you away but he's saying that's like when you're ill, like when you've got a disease, you, you'll be like, oh, I don't want to drink. I'm hungover. No way. But then he's saying, but there, so there is that repulsion and, and uh, attraction, but there is also a different one that happens through reason. I think you it was might just think of this as willpower. Maybe another way to say it is willpower. If you have strong willpower, then, and you know you shouldn't drink, maybe you have a drinking problem, or maybe um, you know you have to get up early tomorrow morning, whatever the reason. Your, your reason tells you don't drink, but if you have weak willpower, you may drink anyway. 
but if you have strong willpower, you won't. Right, so, and this is the significance of saying it's something different from reason. There is something right. different from reason that yeah. draws us in. If you have strong reason, but weak willpower, then you may drink anyway. Does that make sense? And he's associating one mm -hmm. with, at the bottom of mm -hmm. 397, mm -hmm. love. Love is associated. Well, love is what he's associating with the appetitive part. So you have that desire to drink, that love of drink, and you have that rational part. And we agree these two exist, he says. That these two forms then, let us assume, have been marked off as actually existing in the soul. But now we have this other part, this high-spirited part, or what he's calling anger, what I just called willpower. And that's, a, and that's another part. Or then the question comes up, is it another part or is it part of the appetitive? Right, okay. So there is a reasoning part and there is mm -hmm. a loving part and there is a mean in between that can fight for what's right or mm -hmm. admonish you for looking at the accident mm -hmm. when you knew it was going to be horrific. Mm -hmm. That's interesting because um, when we did the symposium, there was also love, which is a desire mm -hmm. that was mm -hmm. mischaracterized by all the other speech givers. But then there was Diotima who had the best understanding and should rule. And thankfully mm -hmm. Socrates recognized that mm -hmm. and took her leadership mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. the reasoning was saying something different about how love should be utilized and its mm. nature. And also in the symposium, there was a mean term, the daemon or the spirit of, of love that mm -hmm. somehow drew you away from loving just physical bodies mm -hmm. to then again, loving the sciences. And in, in that text, mm -hmm. he talked about, the sciences that are different with different subjects and then mm -hmm. the the knowledge of all knowledges or the science of all sciences mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so i wonder if um there is a similarity between that mean term of thumos here and whatever it was i guess the spirit of love the daemon of love in the symposium i would say that he's doing something different and it would take us off track to try to compare those two. Um, here he's talking about the three elements or parts of the soul. Right. I, I'm, I'm sort of um, yeah. leaving the particulars to talk about the principle of mm -hmm. um, mean mm -hmm. analogies, I suppose, mm -hmm. going from the appetite mm -hmm. of, to the reasoning. Mm -hmm. But uh, for love, because he's saying love applies mm -hmm. to the ap ap mm -hmm. appetitive, but mm -hmm. in the symposium we talked about it shouldn't stop there. It mm -hmm. should be well, ruled by reason. Well, in the symposium, love was the mediator between gods and humans. And the human soul contains is all three parts together, connected by love to the divine. Interesting. So it started as love for physical, uh, a single physical body, which mm -hmm. seemed very appetitive. Mm -hmm. So I guess mm -hmm. there was two levels. Yeah. There was the. Right. And you might say that love takes us through the three parts of the soul, right? Because it starts with the appetitive and it takes us up to the wisdom loving part. Mm -hmm. so you're, I think your microphone is off. Oh, sorry. I guess that's what I was rubbing up against here mm -hmm. when it was saying mm -hmm. that love applies to only the appetitive. That, mm. that didn't seem to be consistent. Yeah. But I suppose if he's starting, mm -hmm. like he's starting with the, um, the city. It's and, a different use of love. Yeah. He's talking about it in a different sense here. But that part of us that desires. Right. Could it be that he's starting mm. with the city in mm. high fever and he has to sort of um, start with love being at the yeah. appetitive and then? No, no. I would say it's more like as you move along that ladder of, objects of of beauty in the symposium your 
developing the virtues more fully. So a person who has not developed the virtues would just desire physical things. Whereas a person who has developed the virtues and has developed sofrasun, where they desire what is best for the soul, they're going to desire the things that the wisdom-loving part of the soul tells them are good. And so that's why they're moving up that ladder towards desiring beauty itself. Oh, okay. So love will always be in the appetitive part of the soul, only right. that when we develop the virtues mm -hmm. like temperance, mm -hmm. they will mm -hmm. all be loving the same thing. So the object that exactly. reason wants also will be the object of love in the appetitive. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I think that was a good um, good way of opening up this section. So thank you for bringing that in. And then next time, then we'll go on to section 15 and see a better sense of how the three parts then function together. Um, those of you watching on YouTube, if you do have any questions or comments, let's get a conversation going in the in the comments section. And as always, please like, please subscribe if you don't already, share with a friend. Let's get everybody reading The Republic. It'll be a better world if people are actually reading stuff like this. Um, so I hope you'll join us next time. Thank you very much. Can I can so I just quickly, I, 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 when I started talking, I saw Jacob go off mic. I don't want to talk over him. Did he have something to say? No, 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 like all this talk of high spiritedness <laughs> made me think back to when we were talking about the guardians, mm -hmm. as that being one of the qualities that the guardians should have was high spiritedness. Good. good. Yes. We're going to see that come back in. Very good. Mm. Okay. So there's a little bit of a cliffhanger then as we go on. So hope you'll join us next week. Thank you very much. So like. Good.